Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can, um, we do record the show every week as we are doing today and you can watch it later um, at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with um, your friends, family, uh, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you joining us who are not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. We are similar to your state library. So we provide services and training and resources um, to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, we have book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, and today um, we have commission staff, Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations and we keep bring in guest speakers. And today we have a little of both. Uh, joining us this morning is um, Sally Snyder, who is the coordinator of children and young adult library services here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Good morning, Sally. And Dana Vontaine, who is librarian at Fremont High School in here in Fremont, um, Nebraska. Good morning, Dana. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, and this is um, for Sally, the third of her regular annual book sessions that she does. Um, she does a session on children's books, which was done um, November. Find it here. Oh, Best new children's books of 2023, November 22nd. And then she does a session on books for your summer reading program for the next year, which was done on December 20th. Uh, summer reading program 2024 adventure begins at your library. So the recordings of both of those, the children's and the adventure uh, and the summer reading are up on our archives. And the today is the third of the ones you usually do, which is the best new teen reads. Um, so things for older um, uh, kids that would come into your libraries. And uh, Dana and Sally do this together, a little tag team thing. And I think we're gonna start with Dana. So I will just have you go ahead and take it away. Tell us about all the cool new books you read over the last year. <coughs> oh, of course, that's how it always it's happens. <laughs> it's been a day, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, if I start rambling on too long, please just cut me off and say next or something because a lot of these books have been like my favorite of 23 and 2024. So I'm like, uh, I have a really long list and a lot of them are horror and a lot of them are LGBTQIA themed. So nice. buckle up. <laughs> and I'll also mention too, while, while we're starting off here, so people know the slides that you're going to see today and their lists will be available to you afterwards as well. So don't worry about trying to scribble down all these titles and things you hear right now. Just go ahead and listen, maybe make a little note about ones that you really are interested in, but you will have full slides and full lists um, afterwards to refer to. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> No, it's fine. All right. And so Krista kind of introduced us already. Um, Sally Snyder, book wizard, book wizard extraordinaire. <laughs> and librarian book princess at Fremont High School. That's me. So <laughs> my first, oh, why aren't the pictures coming up? That's cool. All right, um, Heartstopper. Well, if you guys wanna, you guys can look at my slides as well. Heartstopper, the series, it's written by Alice Oseman. Um, I kind of showcased the fifth book um, it has real issues. It's LGBTQIA friendly. It's also now a popular series on Netflix. And yeah. then fun fact, last book is scheduled to come out within the next two years. So the end of the series is near, which will stop my heart because I loved it so much. <laughs> Nick and Charlie are boys that are in different social circles. Nick is a jock and Charlie is more of an artist. Excuse me, they have mega chemistry, but Nick but does Nick actually feel the same way Charlie does? Only time will tell. And spoiler alert, they do fall in love and they do say the L word and it's very sweet. And just a good wholesome, a good wholesome series to get into. 
Field of Screams. I just finished this one and it's a good old fashioned horror novel. It's set in Iowa out in the country. So kind of like children of the corn type of thing. Um, it's reference, if there are a ton of references which are really fun to a lot of horror novels within the book. And it's pretty, it's a pretty short read. So it's good to just get it, like get it done on a weekend and just kind of indulge in that. Field of Screams, Rebecca is obsessed with ghosts. She finds out her deceased father was also obsessed with them. The adults in her life don't take her seriously and hate that she reads ghost stories. During the summer, she stays with her uncle and aunt in Iowa, and she's on babysitting duty this summer. She feels that the farm is haunted. Is she seeing things, or is there really a ghost on the farm? And everyone, of course, says, oh, you're seeing things. No. <laughs> Promise, boys. I begged Sally. I begged Sally to have this on my list because I loved it so much. Dark Academia. Dark act Academia is a real trend right now in young adult fiction. A murder most foul. There's a horrible principal, but don't worry, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Twists and turns. Um, Promise Boys. Principal Moore is unpleasant to say the least. He's downright abusive in some situations. There are literal lines drawn around the school and if a boy, usually an inner city person of color, steps out of line, they are severely punished. One day Principal Moore turns up dead. It's told in three alternating voices, Ramon, JB, and Trey. Um, they, all three of those are accused of the murder. And yes, they made poor choices, but is murder really one of them? This is one of my favorites. Of course, all of these are one of my favorites. I mean, I say that a lot. And then, of course, The Fourth Wing and the Iron Flame. You better buy multiple copies for your libraries. I can't, their holds list are like hundreds of people long. Readers and non readers alike. This is like, Hunger Games, Harry Potter level of wanting this book. Um, there was even a midnight release for Iron Flame. So, I mean, it's really hot right now. Dragons, it's basically a dragon school. Think Hunger Games meets Harry Potter meets Game of Thrones. Wow, Fourth Wing, what? I know it does, it <laughs> really does. And it has like a female protagonist and it has parental, you know, fighting and strife and things like that. And yeah, it has a little bit of everything in it. Oh, and it's also kind of classified as romanticy, that new term that's being coined. So there's a little bit of it there as well. Violet Sorenthal signed up for a quiet life among books. She likes history, she likes books, she doesn't like action in the least. Needing her help, her mother shoves her into a dragon riding school where it is competitive. She might even be incinerated by a dragon if she's not careful. Her mom wants to build her up, but without being able to trust anyone, how far can Violet get? Spoiler alert, number two, Iron Flame. <laughs> Violet exceeded everyone's expectations. <laughs> she survived. However, there is a hidden secret that only Violet and the upper administrators know about, and all could come down on their heads any day now. So it's I can't keep this on my shelves. In fact, like I even bought like my personal copy to school. So oh, guys, the Davenports written by Crystal Marquise. Oh. And then the second one is coming in November, 2024. It is swoon worthy. Like there, it's basically like a reality show written back in 1910, but it was based on a true story actually um, of this rich, for slave who built the carriage company. So it's really good. Um, the Davenports, this is such a swoon worthy romance, your readers will gobble this up. And it's obviously over dramatized, but it tells the story of four women, Olivia, Helen, Amy Rose, and Ruby, who are part of a wealthy African American family. Um, two of them are sisters, but there's also like two friends that come in and make appearances. They live um, part of a wealthy African-American family who live a lavish lifestyle. Amy Rose is a maid, but she 
was she used to be a childhood friend but she came on really rough times and so the family just kind of took her in and said you can work for us and we'll give you money but there's drama there with love and olivia the wise older daughter who's going to do her duty and get married falls in love with this um civil rights leader and so she wants to do her duty and get married but she also wants to follow her heart um helen doesn't want any part of the love stuff she wants to just work on her cars which is kind of unheard of for a woman back in the day and she kind of falls in love with somebody so that's an interesting dynamic to see and then davenport's number two um a lot of these advanced copies are found on netgalley and you can go and download them with your kindle and read them ahead of time which i did it's kind of my kryptonite so davenport's number two or or on idolize idolize plus ruby newly engaged until someone uh, ruby is newly engaged but someone or something threatens to ruin her reputation and reputation is everything back then Olivia, who is hoping that she runs into her dashing lawyer crush again, but her parents tried to arrange a marriage to somebody else. Amy Rose is following her dreams until they are dashed again, and she finds she's still in love with John, which is a brother to the other two sisters. And Helen's, Helen is the one who works on cars uh, and carriages and things. Helen wants to change the carriage industry for the better but she meets a race car driver that kind of sweeps her off her feet. And it's a total enemies to lovers trope. It's the best. Then highly suspicious and unfairly cute. You will finish this in a day. It's adorable. Um, I really like that there was plus size representation in this novel. Um, there's also mental health representation and it's kind of a unique story and it has cryptids because the main character in this um, Celine, she has kind of like a YouTube podcast type of thing and everyone just eats her up because she's so cute and adorable. Um, Celine and Bradley are ex-best friends. Bradley is a jo jock who did Celine for the popular kids table and Celine is a conspiracy theory loving online influencer. When they sign up without knowing the other signed up for a survival contest, they team up and try to win the grand prize. Will Celine's quirks and Bradley's OCD be a good combination, or will it implode like their friendship? Artie and the Wolf Moon. This is a graphic novel. It has werewolves, vampires, representation, and diversity. Artie and the Wolf Moon is a graphic novel about a teenager who is kind of a late bloomer. She and her mom move around a lot, and you will find why out why if you read it. Her mom works for the Game and Parks Commission. How appropriate when you find out that they're a family of werewolves. When someone makes her mad, she is bullied, she transforms into a werewolf and starts to fit in with her extended family and friends. Her family and friends are hiding secrets though. Vampires turn out to be their mortal enemies and she doesn't know who to trust or actually how to harness her powers. So her powers are kind of out of control and they just kind of pop up at the most inopportune times. Now this is more like upper high school, like more adult-ish, but T. Kingfisher, T. Kingfisher's Thorn Edge is the best book I read in 2023. I'm telling everybody about this. And it's just a really short novella, but the story is amazing. It's a fairy tale re retelling. It kind of has elements of Rapunzel. It kind of has elements of the Frog Prince. It kind of has elements of, you know, Prince. It's a lot of folklore as well. It has great characters. Toadling is a changeling. She was born or she was stolen from her royal heritage. She was stolen from her people when she was young. She was raised in a swamp and is hiding a horrible secret. After centuries of hanging out in the swamp, a knight comes in, in search of something or someone. He's kind of poking around where his nose doesn't belong. And he has Totling to show him around, and he has Totling about a curse, but Totling will give her life to upload, to up, upload, uphold her the said curse. So good.
Moth Keeper, it's a graphic novel. Um, there are not werewolves or vampires in this. Sorry, I didn't change that. Um, it's it's called The Moth Keeper. It's written by Kay O'Neill. It has a lot of like manga elements to it. Anya grows tired of her prestigious, prestigious job as a moth keeper. Rewind back to when she was appointed. She was excited to give back to her community and to take care of the flowers that the moths take care of. But she grows tired and lonely and she misses the daylight because it's a night position. So she sleeps during the day and she's it's kind of a lone position. One day, Aunt Anya drops the ball and leaves her post. She does the right thing, but can her mistake be fixed? Okay, and this is also like Teen Killers number one and Teen Killers number two were published in 2022 or 2021 and 2022, but Teen Killers three just came out in 2024 or 2023. And so it is. Like, this is the best series that I've ever read. It's murderous and interesting, but did they really do it? It's twist and turns. So, Teen Killers number one. Signal Deer is classified as a Class A felon, the most dangerous of the dangerous. To avoid prison, Signal goes to a camp where they will train her for a secret project, becoming an assassin. However, there here's a twist. Signal was blatantly framed for the murder of her best friend, and she's not a sociopath at all, but she's with all these other sociopaths that have been, like, proven and, like, brag about the kills that they've made. She has feelings, and one of those feelings is love. Signal falls in love with one of her colleagues. In fact, he's the most dangerous one at the camp. But they try to escape. Their kill switches engage and they are destroyed. However, that happen what happens when their kill switches are disengaged? So two of their kill switches have been disengaged and so they run away. And so the other people at the camp are tasked with finding them and killing them. But they're friends, so it's really complicated. So Teen Killers number three, Eric wants freedom. Eric is the is the boyfriend companion of Signal. And Signal wants the footage, footage that exonerates her from killing her best friend. The camp members want their friendship back. There is a mole inside the friend group. Who wants Signal put away or killed forever? I read the first one of this series and I didn't realize the other two had come out, so I'm behind already. <laughs> no. no. I was too. I didn't know that the third one came out and I pre-ordered or I ordered it really fast and I read it at the end of last year and it's good. Like the and and Sally, did you know that there's a fourth one? But the fourth one is only in an ebook format that the author has the documents and you have to bargain with her to get the fourth one. Oh my. <laughs> I know, isn't that weird? That's fun. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's called like Noxium or something like that. It starts with an N. All right, Dear Mothman. Told in Diary Entry. And it's a Golden Silver nominee. It's a unique story in their cryptids. I have a soft place in my heart for cryptids. I think they're all just misunderstood. So, <laughs> agree. <laughs> <Told>, yes. Yes. <laughs> Told in a diary entry in letter format, Noah, formerly Nora, writes about um, writes about identity in his best friend's car accident that left his best friend dead, and how they are obsessed with Mothman. Noah continuously writes letters to Mothman and hopes that the cryptid will reveal itself. In the end of the book, Noah goes in search of Mothman, and I'm still determining if Mothman is real or not real, because I think in this book. Noah is a little bit of an unreliable narrator, just a little bit. So mm -hmm. I'm still determining like what really happened. The Braid Girls by Sherry Winston. A really big sense of the community, um, diverse and it's heartwarming. Maggie and Deja have been best friends forever. They were looking forward to an entire summer of hanging out together and laughing or launching their braid business. They can make so much money in their community. A kink has formed in their plan when Maggie's half-sister that no one knew they had, including the, like Maggie's mom, shows up at their doorstep because her mom died in the Bahamas. And so, of course, they go. she goes and lives with her dad 
um, Callie shows up and Callie and Deja become best friends and Maggie is kind of left out a little bit. Maggie didn't even know that she had a half sister and now she's taken over her life. When the three go to camp and Camper's hair start, starts to grow out, Deja, Kelly, and Maggie take the bull by the horns and start braiding. A rival braiding startup challenges the girls' money and business hopes. And this, may the best braiders win. Guys, this book, you need to buy two copies for your library because I think it's going to be amazing. So everyone's comparing it to Dumplin and Jay-Z Jones and the Six, but it is giving straight up Dolly Parton vibes. Yes, it's. The I best. get that from the cover right away. Yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> and it is. Um, I have two on the list that are like that. So, um, it's LGBTQIA plus, and it's coming in April twenty four. But you can get, you can get the arc, the e arc on Idolize Plus or um, Net Galley, and I finished this in like a day. It's just so awesome. I received an orphan. Uh, um, it flashes back in time and it goes back and forth from the 1960s when Deckley was up and coming, Deckley Castle. Deckley Castle is dead. Her televised funeral unveils an empty time capsule. There's a surprise to whoever finds it and opens it. Darren Purchase, a lifetime country fan and Deckley obsessive, is on the case. She will find this time cap capsule if it kills her because she is obsessed with Deckley Castle. She sets on a road trip with her, with her co-worker, Kendall. Back in the 60s, up-and-comer Deckley begs, borrows, and steals her way to glory. She collaborates with McKinley, and when, like, McKinley is another star, and when they're on top of their careers, McKinley disappears. And there's a family secret that nobody is talking about. There's always secrets. There's always secrets in everything. So, but it's a page turner. It's so good. The Lost Library, I had to include a library book on here because, but who can really say no to a narrator named Mortimer the Cat, who's a big fluffy orange cat that's talking? Like, how can you really say no to that? Albany, California, a small town with big consequences. There was a, oh wait, no, sorry. The Lost Library told an alternating points of view, Mortimer the Cat, Al the Ghost Librarian, and Evan the Boy in the story, a little free library just pops up unannounced in the little town of Mainville. Nothing exciting ever happens here, but there's a first time for everything. Evan chooses two more books. One is a link to a long ago secret, one that nobody wants to talk about. Again, what actually happened? So it's a little bit of a mystery, and there's a little free library in it, and I love it. Accountable. And this is nonfiction. It reads reads like realistic fiction. But it talks about the dangers of social media and who's accountable. And justice is really served in this. Albany, California, small town with big consequences. There was a social media account that made racist and sexist remarks. Think like a real life burn book for Mean Girls. This book, or the events of this book rather, took place when social media was in its infancy. This book discusses cyberbullying and cybercrime. Who is accountable and how are they made to be accountable when everything happens behind a screen? And you may not know who the author actually is. Sally, did you, you have, have the an award certificate on the, I mean, an award thing on the, on the cover? Yeah. What award did it win? Um, I'm not Sorry. sure. I'm trying to. No, I'm, I'm not sure, but I also thought it it won a Prince. Might, might be a Cybird or something. I don't know. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, I will have to look it up too. But I'm pretty sure it won a Prince as well. Oh. But I, yeah. So, but I'm not sure. I'll have to look that up too. Sally, did you have the Thieves Gambit on your page? No, I don't. I haven't read that. Okay. You have had several titles I haven't even run across, so I'm going to be oh, busy. Good. I know, I know it has been a crazy year. So, all right, the thieves, the thieves gambit. Like, think of Hunger Games, Inheritance Games, Mr. Limoncello's Library, all of those like in in the thieves gambit. Action, action, action. 
Um, this has also been flying off my shelves. Um, it's very diverse. Much like the Inheritance games and the Hunger Games, the main character, Rosalind Quest, competes in the games where the world's best thieves are invited. And there was a lot of drama going up to this and where she was kind of caught, so she needs to pay off some debts. She ha And she has to learn how to trust no one and keep her eyes on the prize, which is one wish for whoever wins. Rosalind really needs the money to make her mother better. Um, I looked up that accountable one, the one that looked like it had a little um, award thing. Yeah, it did. It won the ALA's 2024 Excellence in Nonfiction for Young Adults Award. That's what that oh. on it. Yeah, which it was the um, that's what that is on there. Yeah, okay. which was just announced what two days ago. Yeah. <laughs> oh, awesome. All right, creeples. Sally, you remember that book that we both liked that no one else liked? Like the, the oddity book? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. That we both liked that no one else liked. This is kind of like that book. Um, it's really I'm going to love great. it. What? I'm going to love it, I'm sure. I haven't read oh, it. Oh, yes. It is funny. Um, more middle grade than young adult, but it's STEM. Um, Far-fetched STEM, like creating humanoid creatures STEM, but it's still STEM nonetheless. Haberdasher Academy of Science, where all the students are encouraged to create and learn and interact with Mongolian death worms? No, that can't be right. When students at the Academy try to save a beloved teacher's department, they try to create something magnificent. Instead, they create six humanoids who wreak havoc on the campus. Enter the bad guy. It seems that there's an evil force, the Academy, making sure that the good guys don't win this time. And then you're not supposed to die tonight. It's creepy. There's, like I said, there's a lot of horror on my list this time. It's short. It's kind of like the taking of Jake Livingston. Who needs haunted houses when you have a full, immersive experience? Charity is the final girl in a terror game where guests pay to be scared. However, at the end of the summer, her coworkers start disappearing. And her and her girlfriend, I think it's like Jesus or Bexus or something, um, she, they're trying to work together to figure out the murder mystery. But will Charity be the actual final girl? And if you all don't know what a final girl is, a final girl is somebody who survives the horror story. Tilly and Technicolor, this is another really cute read. Um, both of the characters in this book are neurodiverse. So one has executive functioning disorder and one has autism. Um, it's a sweet summer romance, though. Tilly is a little bit neurospicy. She does not know what she wants, but she does know it's not working for her sister's startup. Then she meets Oliver. Also, Oliver is also neurodivergent, except she except he does know what he wants and knows how to get it. When these two come together, chaos ensues. Can they survive the summer together? Camp Damascus. This is really, like, it weighs heavy on your heart, kind of, but it's a horror novel, but it's truly hor horrific. It's a little bit of allegory and symbolism. The ca this camp is marketed as the best conversion camp that will scare the gay away. However, in the administration building, something dark and sinister awaits the campers, and they don't know. Okay, I don't want to give too much away. But it's G, and there are some trigger warnings, lots of homophobia, and commercials. So it's, it's a short read, but very good. On the Black Queen, Noah Albright is dead. She was set to become the first. Um, the first black homecoming queen. And the person who actually tries to solve the mystery is the white runner up. So she also wants to solve the mystery of Nova Albright. She was going to break boundaries. Um, someone didn't give her that chance. The white runner up and Nova's friends have to solve this mystery before anyone else ends up dead or worse. And then another one that's kind of like the every time you hear that song is called a little bit country except this is kind of like lgbtqia lots of dollywood vibes except this this land is called like wanda land 
in its romance and realistic fiction. Wanda Jean Stubbs, the country music legend and amusement park owner, has been feuding with Verna Rose since the beginning of time. However, Verna Rose's grandson hates country music, and but all of a sudden he has to work at Wanda Land. When Emmett takes a job at Wanda World, oh, Wanda World, sorry, and Verna Rose's grandson does the same, sparks fly. With every feud, there is a secret. What does Verna's Roses and Rwanda's secret. And then my last two is Laura Olympus. It is a webtoon originally, and they just compiled these. Um, it's based on mythology, and it's in graphic novel format. This is a little spicy, but it really focuses on this story of Hades and Persephone with lots of side stories from other gods and goddesses. And there's a modern twist with these, though. Sometimes they're a little spicy, but the artwork is great. And so these came out a couple years ago. And there's the third one, but the fifth one just came out. And they're all just like you can read them in a day and the artwork is just great sometimes it's hard to tell the difference of like who everyone is like within the gods and goddesses but it's a very good story and it's kind of it kind of has like a modern twist all right only she came back Social media inspired, it's very twisty and turny. This is kind of based on that true crime story of that that girl who's murdered, murdered in the van by her boyfriend and she was on social media and uh, all those things. Yeah, Carrie Dunsmore is the only suspect in her boyfriend's disappearance out in the desert. One of her high school classmates put together a podcast wanting to prove that Carrie didn't do it. However, there are so many twists and turns that no one knows what to believe anymore. Oh, and this is really good. So, all right, that is the end of my presentation. And I will give everyone the link to share that. All right. That was all great. Right. Well, I have a lot more books to read now. <laughs> All right, Sally, I'm going to make you presenter now so you can get your slides up. You should see the pop up for that. Show my screen. Cool. All right, you just got to swap your things. If you go up to display settings at the top, you can switch your monitors. There you go. Perfect. Yay. Well, I hope Dana is still around so she can make comments yeah, on. Yeah, okay. she's here. I, I want you to make comments on my choices too. And you had a couple of titles that I have too, but that's fine. Um, please make your comments like, yeah, please talk about them. I want to hear your point of view as well. Okay. Well, I will then. I yep. decided because this is not my entire list. So when we get our lists up, you will see one that says the Encompass Live list. And then another one that says Sally's complete list or something like that, because I had more books than we're going to have time to talk about today. Fortunately, Dana hit a couple of them, so uh, that helped. Um, so I'm calling this the best of the best teen reads of 2023 for this show today. And we're going to help. I always have, it always takes me a minute. To, there we go. So I did mine in, a, in a, my usual order. So I start with fiction for younger readers. And I put this in the younger readers category. It's kind of an upper elementary middle school title, but I had to add it here. This is a Newbery honor book. It's hilarious, goofy, and heartbreaking. This is an amazing book. Simon and his parents moved from near Omaha to a part of Nebraska that is a national radio quiet zone. That's fictional. The real one of those is in West Virginia. There is no internet access in this town, and the town, Grin and Barrett, Nebraska, are living with it. Simon has been homeschooled for the past year, <clears throat> but now, <clears throat> excuse me, now he is back in public school for the seventh grade. He makes a couple of friends, and he begins to settle in. His mom is an undertaker for the town, and they live in the mortuary. His dad works for the Catholic Church. Amazingly written, quirky people and animals, unusual situations will keep the students reading. There is a spoiler I have to give you. A school shooting that happened in the past is revisited. It will break your heart. 
This is a full color graphic novel. Mia has a Jewish mom and a new stepfather who, and they both encourage her to participate and find herself in the Jewish faith. And she's, she's doing that. She's attending a Jewish school and she's enjoying learning about her Jewish side. But her birth father is Native American and she wants to learn about that side of her heritage too. Since her mom doesn't want to talk about him, Mia decides to secretly visit him and his family. Attending a powwow and learning about his Muskegee Nation culture is satisfying. He lives in Oklahoma. Then her mother finds out about her lies and zips in to take her home. Over time, her mother comes to understand Mia's need to know her father and her Muskegee ways. They come to an agreement to set up a schedule for Mia to visit Oklahoma. This is fiction inspired by the author's life. And it's very well done. And you get a real sense of her um, bringing these two cultures together for her life, who she is. Julia is 13 and she will soon be starting eighth grade. And she enjoys volunteering with rescued horses at the stable where she rides. Her best friend, Nori, who is not a horsey person, supports her, but after being gone to camp for two months, Nori has a new boyfriend and Julia is feeling left behind. Julia's sister, Danielle, gives her a makeover since Julia's feeling low. When she sees the results, she can't believe it. She looks 16. Danielle has to leave, so Julia takes a few selfies and posts one on social media. Soon she is DMing with a cute guy from a nearby school. He is in the 10th grade and seems to understand her much better than anybody else does. After a couple of safe dates where they meet at the mall, they stay in the mall, and then they separate to go home again, he um, takes her to a nearby hotel to meet his friend. When she realizes what is really happening, that she will soon be a victim of human trafficking, she manages to escape. She never wants to think about it again, but now one of her new friends is talking with a guy she doesn't know, and Julia realizes she has to tell her friends what nearly happened to her. It's definitely a cautionary tale, but the story flows well and readers will relate to the changes Julia is going through and will care about her troubles and her good times. So pretty scary stuff. Scary in a different way from the books that Dana was talking about. Yeah, that is my nightmare, though. Human yeah. trafficking stuff. Uh, this is a full color graphic novel, and it's a sequel to her first book, which was Who the F Are You? The family takes a road trip and visits Disney World. Huda tries to let the stares from others roll off her back, hence the title, trying not to care about what other people think of her, she and her family. They, all of the girl, her sisters, they all wear the Oh, I can't, hijab, is that it? Anyway, and the typical questions that aren't you hot and that kind of thing they get. She meets a girl at, the, at Disney who is loving the same book she does and they really hit it off. And that girl never asks her a stupid question, though the boy with her does. And it's really a lovely way of demonstrating things that people face again and again. Muslims and other people all have some things that we, who do not understand their life, ridiculously ask either innocently or intentionally mean. But um, when, when they hit it off, it tempts her to disobey her parents, what they have for them visiting the park. Still, she bonds somewhat with her sisters and her new friends, and overall, they do have a good time. That is 14, and she and her family live on the edge of the red light district in Bihar, India. She has been told all of her life that her contribution to the family will be to be sold to the, into the sex trade when she comes of age, and that time is imminent. She accepts the opportunity to learn Kung Fu with the girls living in the hostel next to her former school. It gives her a feeling of control and stability. And soon she is at the hostel for her own safety after nearly being kidnapped by the man who was counting on buying her. When she shows her prowess competing in Kung Fu events, her family is thrilled since it is actually her heritage, her family, her uncles had all been competitors in the past. And she does win some prize money. The man who believes he owns her or will discovers that he never had a chance with all the family and friends who now support her. So she has a positive outcome, but this is something that happens today to young women. Uh, first time in five years that Carl Hyacin has written another book for younger readers, young adults. 
Valdez Jones, the eighth, he's 15, and he uses the nickname Wrecker because his five greats grandfather made a living salvaging ships. He is biracial, having both black and white family members. Key West is home, and he loves being on the water in a skiff. But one day, he accidentally became trapped into helping a smuggler, and he cannot seem to find a way to free himself from this. It has an intriguing mystery, touches on some sad local history from 1921. There are also concerns about the damage big, big cruise ships inflict on the ecosystem of the harbor and living in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. There is a new friendship with Willie who has her own issues that she's dealing with, but she's also helping him work through this mystery. So there's a lot going on, but it's well-written of course, because it's Carl Hyacin. I did, I, I love forgot it. to mention that I have these, crib notes here because if I don't um, I will be talking at noon and, and everybody will be mad at me so that's why I keep looking down at my papers so I stay on topic. Uh, Gordon Corman had two new books out last year and I'm going to talk about one of them the super teacher project. It's told from several points of view. The new teacher Mr. Adact is he looks like a student teacher but he has a student teacher who looks old. He calls the students pupils, which they all think is weird, and he can catch a fly between his thumb and forefinger, just like that, not a problem. Strange as he is, the students begin to like him and he is soon the favorite teacher at the middle school. One day, friends Oliver and Nathan try to look up Mr. Adact on the internet, but they find nothing. They do find the student teacher, Mr. Perkins' address. So they go over there, ride their bikes over there, find his apartment number, and they use one of those old fashioned cardboard periscopes to look in the window. And what they see shocks them. As readers will have suspected, Mr. Adact is not human. He is a robot. When Mr. Adact's future is threatened by the government agency that created him, the students put together a plan to save him. And this is a great, effort um, to make sure that he can get away and live his life. Corman addresses artificial intelligence, middle schoolers behaviors, intricate planning, and different points of view. It's lots of fun and you're rooting for the event. A senior in high school, Jared volunteers to help for a week at Camp Sunshine. His name was drawn out of a hat and off he went, not knowing what to expect. He was assigned, along with another person, Joy, a one-on-one -on -one with Diego, who's 13, who had brain cancer. And along for Jared, he also was assigned a family with three kids, one of whom had recently completed chemotherapy. At first, he thought working there would be sad and depressing, but instead it was fun and positive. Families were taking a break from chemo and operations in order to just be together in a fun environment. So the whole family is there, not just the child. And his job was to focus on the fun for the kids he's assigned. And uh, after I graduated from college, I worked for that summer at Camp Easter Seal and I had the same uh, experience as he describes in here. So I could really relate to what he was talking about. It's a wonderful full color graphic novel. And um, I think it's a great addition to anybody's collection. I got a little creepy. I don't have near this tolerance you do, Dana, for scary books. I started to try to read their vicious games, and I couldn't. I had to put it down. I don't know if you read that. The vicious games? Their vicious games? It's oh, yeah. Oh, oh, I have not. I will. Write it's that not down. on my list because I, I took it back to the library. I'm sorry. I'm a chicken. <laughs> I apologize. Anyway, Maggie is extremely disappointed that her parents, at the last minute, let her know then instead of going to Camp Rising Star for three weeks with her best friend, Maggie, she will, oh no, with her best friend, Maggie will be attending Camp Sylvania, a fat camp. Once there, Camp Sylvania is weird. The campers have the expected exercise each morning, up the hill, down the hill, up the hill, down the hill. But only 15 campers are allowed to swim in the lake each day, and no one can use the jet skis, they're too dangerous and campers are expected to give blood almost every day. And they're teenagers, they're not adults to give blood. So this is all kind of weird. Maggie begins to suspect that the camp owner, Sylvia, 
is a vampire. Body acceptance, supporting each other, and meeting a ghost are included in this tale. Living in London, Maddie, 14, the middle child, her older sister, Chi Chi, 17, and younger brother, Tana, 10, are all missing their mother who had passed away. Chi Chi has been acting out terribly, so their father, Baba, takes them on a trip through their native Zimbabwe. Maddie is slowly telling the story of what happened, why they are on the trip, to a mystical being called a Metikais, visible only to Matty, who comes and goes, and he is also helping her with her grief. Reforming as a family, feeling love, and living through grief is all that they can do. They know things will never be the same, but they could become something else that is good. Ooh, I'm lost. Here we go. This is the first book in the NOAH files. Noah, 14, lives in a small Oregon town and wishes for a larger place to live for more opportunities, but and unusual people show an interest in him. It is just all too weird. His best friend, Ogden, has a unique viewpoint of the world and knows a lot of unusual facts. He is the best friend anyone could hope for. Then Noah begins to experience some bizarre things, like he got to school much faster than he should, and he accidentally flattened Sahara, a member of the school's girls' gymnastics team. She says he jumped out of a tree, but he doesn't remember being in a tree. I don't know what's going on. Noah realizes that some people want to capture him, and he is pushed to avoid them while finding out what is up with his unusual abilities. It seems he can manifest different animals' capabilities and defense mechanisms. Fast-paced, humorous, over-the-top, in intriguing, readers will be ready for a second novel about Noah, his family, and his friends. I like all of his other covers, except for this one. <laughs> yes, I didn't like this one. It, now, I understand now why it's that way, but I still find it off-putting or something. Yeah. Mm. Lila. She is a rising high school senior. She is hard of hearing. She uses hearing aids and lip reads, but she still misses parts of conversations. Her friends are supportive, but they're not aware of how left out she sometimes feels. She spends the summer as a camp counselor at a camp for the deaf and hard of hearing. Her sign language is slow because she doesn't use it very often. One of the other counselors spends time with her helping her improve. She doesn't realize it at first, but her lack of sign language ability is hurting her ability to help her campers. Over time, she improves and begins to see how she had let people down, like her friends at school had unknowingly let her down. There's some romance along the way with some of the issues that the deaf community faces, and the author is deaf. It's a full-color graphic novel. Siblings JJ and Altea are both in middle school. They are first-generation Filipino-Americans and find it a little hard to fit into school. Their mother tells them these folklore lore stories that should help them, but mostly it just makes them roll their eyes. Oh no, she's telling us another one of those stories about those stupid creatures, and I think they're tired of it. However, when their uncle Arvin arrives from the Philippines with dire warnings for their mother, the family soon encounters creatures from their mother's folk tales. The family must pull together. JJ and Altea must discover their hidden talents and skills to help save the world. I mean, I've never had the opportunity to help save the world, but I'm gonna hope I'm ready when, that turn, when my turn comes. <laughs> oh, this is, this is just lovely. It's a full color graphic novel. Maisie is 14 and she is excited to be attending her first fan con. She and her mother are going together. They are both fans. And just as they come inside the door, she immediately meets Ollie, 15, who is working with their father on door duty at the con and they click. Maisie is an amputee and bisexual. The venue has a quiet room and some couch corners, and she will take advantage of them whenever she feels overwhelmed. Maisie's main purpose at the fan con is to meet Cara Bufano, an amputee who plays one of the characters on her favorite TV show. Unfortunately, the actress was sick and not able to appear. That's a big disappointment, but there was still lots to see and do at the con. Spending more time with Ollie, who was non-binary, was part of that. And then they had to say goodbye. Maybe they can meet again at next year's con. And yes, they do have a nice little kiss. This is just hilarious. And I had to leave it in here because it's by Jean Luen, Luen Yang. And it's book one, volume one. And it's crazy. 
Herodicus Terry is a legendariously legendary hog rider of Triumphica, but he really doesn't fit the mold. He is smaller and tends to fight in his own way rather than following orders. His brother, leader of the hog riders, sends him with three others to overtake the town of Jesse Pickleton. Things start out great for Terry, but then something huge, powerful, and unrecognizable defeats them soundly. His brother kicks him out of the group, and Granny Polkas, she's a hog trainer, convinces him to find out what all, find out more about this secret weapon of Jazzy Pickleton. During his infiltration, he begins to enjoy living there and is torn when his brother asks for information on them. This is an homage to the video games Clash of Clans and Clash Royale, which I've never seen or played myself. I should look for those. This is the first book in a new series that sets the stage for Terry, the people of Jazzy Pickleton, and the dastardly hog riders. It is likely the more bat battles are on the way. Some nonfiction for teens. Don Brown had two new books out last year. This is the one that came out earlier. And of course, he uses the graphic novel format for his nonfiction. <clears throat> when I read this back in June, it was hard to read, knowing all of it was continuing to happen as I was reading this book. The author shows the destruction of the city, the deaths of the citizens, and the efforts people went to to survive and to escape the city. This is all taking place in. My brain just lost it. Who did Russia invade? Ukraine. Thank you, Ukraine. I don't know why my brain just, I don't have it down here. There are black and white and gray illustrations with, of course, an occasional red or orange. This book came out a little bit later last year. Um, again, the graphic novel, nonfiction approach. It's muted full color art with occasional splashes of red or orange. Brown tells the story of a number of Jewish children who escaped the Nazis with help from others, hiding in barns, fields of wheat, or as the children of Christian people, helping them to safety. It's both sobering and hopeful, and it includes source, source, source notes and an extensive bibliography. This is well-researched, and the author uses oral histories, letters, and firsthand accounts of the war in the Philippines and during World War II. The loss of the Philippines to the Japanese the Bataan Death March and the rescue of prisoners in the Kabanatuan camp in the fear that they would be killed is relayed. They kept that very secret because they were afraid if word got out that they were trying to rescue them, they would all be killed immediately. It includes a few poems of some of the soldiers, photos from the time, and maps, plenty of back matter, sources, index, web pages, and a bibliography. As Kirkus says, she does not shy away from relating the horrors of these events in an age appropriate way. And School Library Journal says, a must buy for any public or school library. They did rescue them in case you were worried. Most all of them. I <laughs> so I didn't want you to, to despair. <laughs> this is a full color graphic memoir adopted from South Korea as an infant as was her older sister, Sarah, who now uses they, them, finds it hard to fit in anywhere. Their parents are white and never taught Sarah or her sister much about their heritage. Bullying at school is almost constant for them until their skill in art brings them admiration in grade school. Middle school is different. Whenever they feel low or like striking out, they see themselves as a monster, as you can see on the cover. And this monster face appears from time to time throughout the book. Anime is a wonderful discovery for them, and they immerse themselves in it. Others at first think it is weird, but over time, it becomes more popular. And over time, Sarah discovers they are queer. Have you seen this book yet, um, Dana? You? I haven't read it, though. Okay. It is a wonderful guide to writing, including tips, some personal stories of hers, an encouragement that everyone has a story to tell. Specific suggestions, for example, she at one point says, list three mistakes you've made and why they were mistakes. Now list a benefit that came as a result of each mistake. Ways for you to look into your past and your life and things that have made you who you are today. And each chapter concludes with a, with a page of writing prompts. So anyone who's having, uh, like a public library, some of them have writing 
and groups that get together and practice writing. This has would have a lot of things in there that you could use for that writing group. Or that having be any questions to multiple agencies can, can go through it. Dana? That, that would be great for our creative writing club. Yes, perfect. Yes. And, she, and you learn some things about her life that you never knew. So that's kind of fun too. I love that author. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some fiction for older readers. All her high school life, Perla has concentrated on her family's plan for her. Do all the things on the list and she will be going to Delmont University in the fall on her way to becoming a doctor. Except she is not accepted at Delmont and all her other choices reject her too. Is it because she's only 16 having skipped a couple of grades? Was her essay too weak? She doesn't know. So she fakes an acceptance letter and her parents proudly take her to Delmont where she sneaks into an unoccupied dorm room, attends some classes and makes a couple of friends. Her plan is to experience Delmont so her winter application and essay will be accepted. Eventually it all falls apart. What can she do now? Then the next book was going to be Promise Boys, but Dean already <laughs> talked about that. So I'm moving on to Royal Blood. Right, 17, is the King of England's illegitimate daughter. She has known it for most of her life, but has not been known publicly. She is in trouble again at her 12th or so boarding school, and her assigned caretaker brings her to Britain to Windsor Castle. Too soon, the paparazzi are all over everything she does and everywhere she goes. At a party, her half-sister, Princess Mary, who is her same age and has her same birthday, uh, Princess Mary takes her to this party. She is given a date rape drug. Things get blurry, but she struggles to make her way to the door before she blacks out. When she, when she comes to, she learns that the guy she was with has been killed and she is the top suspect. Did she? Did someone else? And who would that be? This is the first title in a new series. And just so you know, the author supposes that King Edward VIII did not abdicate. And this is his line that is continuing on the throne. So it's not the current King of England that's the father. It's a, a different line of people. And it was intriguing and a good mystery. And um, of course, I am a little bit of a royal follower in that I like to know stories. There are so many stories about princes and princesses and stuff. They're fun. I don't believe anyone will ever really meet one, but there you go. Oh, this Have is you seen Sick, Sally? What's that? Have you seen the musical Six? No. It's all about the Henry Henry the Eighth's six wives. Oh. I just recently saw some like clips and things from that. And I was like, what is this that I'm seeing? It looks very interesting. <laughs> I'll have to very look for that. Thank you. That's fun. I loved this book. Effie is a high school senior. She has cerebral palsy and uses a wheelchair. She has been frustrated for years by the school's lack of accessibility. Now her mother tells her this year she will have to be the advocate for herself. Her mother has charged down to the school every whip stitch and get things better for her. But this year, as a senior, she needs to stand up for herself because next year she's going away to college. That's what her mother tells her. Also going on are her years long crush on a classmate, Wilder, and her efforts to determine which college best suits her neighbor and her, her major, excuse me, her major and her needs. This is well written. The author also has cerebral palsy. And the reader can see Effie's point of view, and it will be, and they will be irked at the issues she has to confront. Everybody has to meet outside the front door. If there's a, an emergency, there are stairs. Why would she go to the front door for you out of an emergency? This kind of stuff drives me crazy. <laughs> I know schools have limited funds, but come on, you got to have a door this girl can get out of for God's sake. Okay, lecture over. Moving on. <laughs> 
Um, I just want to jump in before we go any farther to let people know um, it is a little after 11 o'clock. We started a little after 10. That's fine. Um, but we will go as long as it takes for um, Sally and Dana to get through all the books they're still talking about. I'm not sure how many more you still have, Sally, but I just want to let people know. Um, if you do need to leave because you only allotted the hour for this, that's fine. We're recording the whole show and you can watch the rest of it later um, at your convenience when it's in the show archives. But we will keep going as um, long as it takes. Um, and if you have any comments or questions or books that you want to share, type them into the questions section of the Go to Whatever in webinar interface. Um, Dana and Sally are always happy to hear about more books. Um, these are just a few of the ones that they are highlighting. There are so many books uh, that are published every year. Of course, they do not mention every single one, but I'm always looking for other titles as well. Thank you. That's true. Yeah, so go ahead. Continue. I have a sports book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really bad about reading sports books. Trey Bruin, 15, is thrilled yet nervous about being pulled up from the junior varsity team to play for the varsity team of the OJA Reservation School in Minnesota. Two players were suspended for two games. His older brother Jackson had been an amazing basketball player for the team, but now he is gone due to a car accident. This contains a good amount of sports action along with life on the reservation and the temptations of partying and alcohol. The author is OJA and also played high school basketball on the Red Lake Indian Reservation in Minnesota, so he knows what he's talking about in this book. This was so fun. I kept hearing about this book, and I was on the list for it at the library, and I was like number 75. So uh, it's in paperback. I think it's only in paperback. And so I just bought my own copy. Take care of that. <laughs> this is this. Mallory is 18. It's her, the summer after she graduated from high school and she is not planning on attending college. She has a car repair job and uses the money, it's never enough, to help her family pay the bills. Her mom is struggling with rheumatoid arthritis and her father is dead and her two younger sisters, 14 and 12, at the beginning of the book, always have things they need and want. Then a friend asks her to play chess in a low-key charity event and there she soundly defeats the reigning world champion. She had a promising chess career earlier and walked away from it for the sake of her family. Now she accepts a fellowship in a New Jersey chess club. She will make more money for that than she did fixing cars. Soon she is immersed in chess again and loving it after she promised herself it would only be her day job. Some romance and finding out who she is and what she wants. You heard about this book, Dana? Checkmate. Yeah. She writes a lot of like the love hypothesis books and things like that. Okay. Yeah. I haven't read it though. I really want to. It's a good one. Look at that. I'm going to go ahead, since you asked me to, I'm going to go ahead and read my blurb on it. <laughs> Set in England, the book opens with a three page glossary of English colloquialisms and cultural references for US readers, which is greatly appreciated that it's at the beginning of the book and not at the end. We're like, oh, now I could have used that sooner. Celine is 17 and Bradley is 17, and they used to be best friends. But when, according to Celine, Brad dropped her for the popular crowd and the soccer, they say football in England team, she chose to loathe and ignore him. <laughs> now they are both vying for one of three college scholarships by participating in the Breakspear Enrichment Program, a nature boot camp, plus a chance to meet Catherine Breakspear, a civil rights lawyer Celine admires. They end up on the same team as, an, as time goes by. They each find themselves yearning for the other with no intention of ever mentioning it. This book and several others are the inaugural list of books from the Joy Revolution imprint guided by David and Nicola Yoon. They are young adult romances featuring and written by people of color. And I loved, I saw a, a, a program where they talked about this and David refers to these books as dread free reading. So as a person of color, when you're reading a book about people of color, you're halfway always waiting. What are they going to say that's wrong and stupid? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. These are dread-free reading because they're written by the people that they are representing. And I love that phrase, dread-free reading. Yes, and also they're probably happy and upbeat and not like, you know, they're fighting through this unwinnable cause, you know. Good point, yes. They're stories of people is what it's all about. Yeah. Another book in that list is Queen Bee. 
Lady Ayla Davi, 15, has been disgraced. All a lie told by her former best friend, Poppy. She is sent north to a seminary for, for girls. Three years later, Lady Lyra Whitley, 18, a reinvention of Ayla, has come to London for the season and for revenge against Poppy. Her mentor and benefactor, known as Church, had warned her that revenge was not the way to go. But Ayla, now Lyra, has spent the three years planning the downfall of Poppy. Still, in making new friends, real friends, and in once again seeing the Marquess of Ridley, so handsome, and her former friend as well, because where's my other paper? Here it is. He second guesses her plans and is unsure what she really wants now. There's plenty of tingling, pounding hearts and chaste longing. People of color, others, and others who were left out of Regency romances before do populate the aristocracy in this book as they did in real life, as stated in the author's note. And I also have Hopstop, Hopstopper, Heart <laughs> Stopper, Volume 5. I, did, I do have the two novellas that she wrote that are not graphic novels, one titled Nick and Charlie, a Heart Stopper novella, and the other titled This Winter, also a Heart Stopper novella. They came out in uh, like January and, and uh, later in the fall last year. So you can look for those too. But the reason I have this up here, and I have enjoyed this series so much, I've read them all. It is a continuing love story of Nick and Charlie, including dealing with the fact that next year, Nick will go to college and Charlie has one more year of high school. And I do make a note, I think it's important for me to let you know that this is the first book in which they have sex. As it is a graphic novel, the pages show them in bed with one on top of the other, the blanket up around the armpits. And um, there's kissing and cuddling, but nothing shows, no demonstrations of what they're actually doing. And the author does say that volume six will conclude the series, which Dana mentioned. I hope, my hope is that they, when they go to college, I hope they don't break up. Like that's what I'm really worried about. <laughs> Me too, because they have had such love for each other. It's hard to think that that could happen, but. I don't know what she's going to do. Right. Shelby, 16, is a high school senior, and because she skipped a grade, it takes a while to find out that Shelby has bipolar disorder and had a very bad episode in the recent past. She is now concentrating on keeping a low profile and graduating high school. Enter Andy Criddle, a high school senior also, who accidentally texted her a wrong number text while drunk at a party. She asks him not to drive, but he does and has an accident. Shelby, he's okay, but Shelby finds car accident scenes interesting and she finds Andy's wallet, returning it to him at school. As a friendship begins, Shelby asks Andy to sign a friendship agreement, which includes number six, do not, under any circumstances, fall in love with Shelby. And he signs it. Things go well for a while as friends and then they go badly. By the end of the book, Andy is going to AA and Shelby will not see him, but is she is continuing to take care of herself. So it's quite a, um, a trip they, they were both on. And the last book on my, oh, I'm gonna mention a couple of other things, so sorry. This is the last book I'm gonna talk about specifically, Hungry Ghost. It's four color graphic novel with black, white, light green and blue gray throughout the book. Val is a high school senior and she has spent her life worrying about food and her weight. She regularly purges what she has eaten keeping that secret even from her mom, who constantly encourages, say nags, her not to eat too much. She hides what she does. Whenever she can, she vomits the food she ate. But on a school trip to Paris, purging is difficult and she begins to consider her life. She has to return home, home early because her father died in a plane crash. He had always said that he would have no regrets because he lived every day to its fullest. Val has not, and she wonders what her father would have said. After an outburst at her best friend, Jordan, who is plump, fun, and brings out the best in others, Val realizes she needs help to manage and work through her opinions of herself manifested in binging, binging and purging. The author's note states, Val is not me, but I am her. And there are also resources listed. And the only thing I wanted to mention beyond this is on my, on my full list, you'll see the 
series, new titles in series, etc. I do list three titles written by Rainbow Rowell about She-Hulk, who, and I have read those, they were fun. I never knew anything about She-Hulk before I read those. So I know that the other people were writing She-Hulk books and, but these are the ones by Rainbow Rowell. So I thought people should at least know that they're around. Maybe they have She-Hulk fans at their library. I, yeah, absolutely. All right, you said that was your last one, Sally? Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, thank you so much, Dana and Sally. Um, no, it doesn't look like any, um, uh, anyone had any questions or comments? That's fine. Um, I am going to uh, pull presenter control back to my screen because I wanted to show. Um, so as I said, all of the um, the slides and um, the lists will be, um, Sally's list will be available. There we go. Um, we got some thank yous coming in, of course, uh, to this. Thank you, Krista, Dana, and Sally. You're welcome, Joey. Um, Sally always posts her lists for the children's books, some reading program, and the teens on our website in our handouts page. If you go to the Nebraska Library Commission's homepage and just use the search feature up here at the top and type in handouts, you'll see that comes up as a uh, suggestion. And it is the first uh, link that comes up as one of our starred links. Uh, so um, her the list for today is not up yet. She's still needs, she's been do, uh, traveling, doing some uh, doing some reading program workshops, but uh, will be up uh, maybe by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, to um, she'll have uh, so you'll have the actual list with all of the you know the author information, publisher information, everything will be on here just like the previous ones. And you can see there's her summer reading one, program one from last year, and the um, best new children's books one. So the new ones and all of her previous lists are here too. This is a nice long page. So if you do um, just want to see some previous lists and see what books that she um, mentioned, um, you can go back and look through any of these. Is there anything else you want to say about your lists here, Sally? Um, no, I think you covered it pretty well. Thank you. Oh, oh. I know you usually show you show that sometimes when you're doing it, but I wanted to make sure we got that out there for everyone. <laughs> All right, so um, that will wrap it up for today's show. I'm going to pop back over here to my um, Compass Live pages. And I did mention that um, we do record the show in our archives. Uh, if you go online anywhere and use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, the name of the show, um, well, the only thing that comes up in your search results, it'll be a link to our main page here with our upcoming shows and also uh, potentially links to our archive shows. Um, but here's the link to the archive right underneath our upcoming shows. Today's show, and there's last week, so today's show will be at the top of the list, most recent ones first. Um, it should also be up by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, we put, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. Um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email directly from me um, when I also post it out to our mailing lists here in Nebraska, letting you know when the recording is available. Uh, we also push this information out to our um, social media. We do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. If you like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We do reminders. Here's a reminder about logging into today's show, meet the presenter sessions. Um, yeah, we got here. Uh, here we go. Recording of yesterday, the previous week's show, so when recordings are available. So if you want to keep up on things we are doing, you can um, give us a like over there. We also post onto Twitter and Instagram using the um, hashtag for the show, Encomp Live, a little abbreviation of our show name. So you can keep an eye on things we're doing there as well. Um, and also just, you know, watch the websites, uh, join our mailing list or Nebraska link mailing list for Nebraska library staff. Uh, while we're here in the archives, I will show you there is a search feature if you want to see if we've done a show on any topic you might be interested in. You can search the full show archives or just the most recent year's worth, most recent 12 months um, if you want something just current. And that is because this is our full show archives. And I'm not going to scroll all the way down because it's a giant page, as you can see here. Um, and Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. So this year, 2024, is our 16th year of the show. Oh my gosh, we're sweet 16. <laughs> um, and uh, we have all of our shows here. Um, so that's why it is a huge list, over 700 um, archive recordings. Uh, but they do all have an original broadcast date listed to them next to them. So um, many of the shows will be fine to watch 
you know, whenever they stand the test of time, great useful resources. Um, but some things will become old, like, like, you know, Sally's previous, all the, all, Sally and Dana's previous shows about book talks. I can't imagine how they would ever be, you know, they just won't be new for that year, but the books are still out there and still good books. Um, but some things will become old and um, outdated resources may have changed drastically or have, you know, disappeared completely. Um, people will work at different libraries now, much potentially. Yeah. Um, there may be broken links because if things have, have changed so differently or gone away. So just pay attention to that when you're watching any of the older shows, but they all have an original broadcast date. So you, so you know when they were actually um, originally done. But as long as this is something libraries do, we keep things for historical purposes so people have access to them. And as long as we have a place to host our shows, which right now is on the Library Commission's YouTube channel, we will always have them out there available to you. So that wraps up for today's show. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Thanks again, Dana and Sally. This is great. I always get good ideas for my nieces and nephews from watching your shows. Um, and previously it was the children's ones that you all did. Um, but now my nieces, some of them are getting older. I have anywhere from two-year-old up to, oh, who's the oldest one? 14 now? Yeah. So <laughs> I always get ideas for them for gifts. <laughs> Thieves Gambit. Yeah, yes. Got things on my list. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you. So I hope you'll all join us possibly next week when it is the last Wednesday of the month, which means it is Pretty Sweet Tech Day. As you can see, here's Pretty Sweet Tech also for end of February. Um, Pretty sweet. Amanda Sweet is our technology innovation librarian. And the last Wednesday of the month, she always comes on the show to do something techie related. Uh, we do other shows throughout the month that are tech related too, but you can always guarantee that the last Wednesday of the month will be Amanda talking about something. And next Wednesday, she is doing a WordPress website refresh session. So if you have a WordPress site, either through the Library Commission or um, where we host websites for public libraries or your own, uh, sign up for that one and see um, what Amanda has to share with you about updating your website. And one last thing I want to mention, you might have seen it as I was scrolling through here, is our Big Talk from Small Libraries online conference. This is the when we shared it out to um, the page. Uh, Big Talk from Small Libraries is our annual um, conference where it is online. All of the presenters are from small libraries with an FTE or population served of 10,000 or less. And uh, the it is on the last is always the last Friday in February. So this year is on February 23rd. And just yesterday, the full schedule was posted. Finally got that all figured out. So if you are interested or want to see what your rural and small libraries are doing, and this is a this is not a Nebraska thing. This is a national event. So if you go to the link for the schedule here, you will see that we have um, presenters from all over the country. District of Columbia, Arizona. Uh, we will also be having, you see here, the best small library in America. Uh, the, the, that award came back this year, had been on hold um, since the pandemic had started. Um, but Page Public Library in Arizona was awarded that. They will be joining us. Um, but the full schedule is here and you can register for it. Um, registration has been open. So if you're interested in hearing what your small and rural library colleagues are doing all across the country, uh, check out the schedule, check out information about the speakers. We've got, um, we're, I'm getting more information in, I'm still filling out this page. The full schedule is there, but I'm still getting, uh, speaker info so you can still see that page will get more filled in in the next week or so um, and then register go ahead and sign up to um, join us on February 23rd the entire day is recorded so if you're unable to join us today for the whole day um, or you just have to pop in and out or miss some of them you will have available in our previous conferences we have all of our previous recordings and, um, as well so I just want to give a plug for that since we I did just yesterday announce that the whoop, that this full schedule is ready all right so that wraps it up finally i'll stop talking <laughs> uh thanks everyone and i uh, hope we'll see you on a future episode of m compass live thank bye. you bye bye dana bye